Hello and welcome to our special lunchbox lecture at the National D-Day Memorial. I'm John Long, the Director of Education, and uh, it's going to be a great program I'll introduce in just a minute. Before we get started, though, I want to remind you of a few upcoming events. It's going to be a busy October here at the Memorial. Uh, we have Homefront Day, Homefront Festival on October 1st. We have Home School Day on October 14th and Scout Day for both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts on October 29th. I won't bother you with all the details. They are on our webpage, and we'd love to see you out for any or all of those. Also, a take a minute remind you of our podcast, Someone Talk, the official podcast of the National D-Day Memorial. Our host is uh, the eminent historian, John C. McManus, and uh, we just launched a couple of uh, in the last couple of weeks, a couple of episodes for September, we'll have October programs coming up. Uh, if you have not checked out our podcast, uh, it's we it's great. We have uh, you know, well-known historians, authors, spilling all the secrets of the Second World War, as we often say. Uh, so check that out, any of the uh, the major podcast providers, or on our webpage, on our YouTube page. Uh, we we uh, you, you you'll enjoy the podcast and the content. Uh, one of our other digital initiatives, of course, are these lunchbox lectures. Now this one, a little bit different. We used to have these, uh, you know, with big crowds and not virtual. Then along came a pandemic you might have heard about. So uh, they have been virtual for a long time. Today we're trying something a little bit of a hybrid with a virtual component but also with a live studio audience. Uh, and uh, that they're here because we knew a lot of people would want to hear our speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Vandalin, Korean War veteran, paratrooper, Silver Star recipient, and the way I, I know him and the way a lot of the people here in the room know him, uh, a longtime volunteer, tour guide, and supporter here at the National D-Day Memorial. Uh, he's not only been a tour guide, but he's also been a representative for us to civic groups, doing a lot of talks to Kiwanis clubs or to historical societies out there, uh, and not only giving very fascinating talks on the history of the Second World War, but also being a great ambassador for the uh, National D-Day Memorial, for which, again, we thank you, Bob. Uh, but I will get out of the way now and turn it over to our speaker, Bob Vandeman. Thank you, John, for that nice introduction. And thank all you folks for being here, giving me support today. At the end of World War II, the paratroopers were written about and talked about, movies made about a lot, and that's really um, they were deserving because of all of the contributions they made during World War II. But there's a lot of units that were put together in order to, for the Normandy invasion to be successful. And one of those units I think has been overlooked by history and been ignored and not much has been said about it. And so that is my subject today is on gliders used in World War II and the brave pilots who flew them. Now, there's two examples I want to give in the beginning. First of all, at 1030 at night on June the 5th, the British sent up 733 airplanes and 355 gliders uh, to go into Normandy. 90 minutes later, the United States sent up six, 1,662 airplanes and um, 512 gliders uh, was in that group. 800 of those planes happened to be C-47s that normally tow the gliders. The second illustration I want to give you is a different battle at a different time. It was December 1950 when our airborne troops were surrounded at Bastogne, the Battle of the Bulge. It was cold and wintry and uh, they were running out of all supplies and 100 gliderman 
volunteered to fly 500 gliders into Bastogne to take in uh, ammunition, medical supplies, uh, doctors, and, and um, uh, other equipment that they needed because they were running low of everything. The, uh, on June 28th, 1919, after World War I ended, the Versailles Treaty was signed. And in that treaty, uh, the, Germany was only allowed to have 100,000 troops, but no Air Force. And Germany uh, started the following month trained some of the men in sail planes. And the way they did that, they took the engine out of the small planes to make sail planes out of them. And on, on May the 10th, 1940, as German, Germany was going to cross Europe, they unleashed their secret weapon. And that secret weapon was 11 gliders uh, with 67 men and um, a German to, to invade the uh, fortress there at Eban Emil, which had 780 German, I mean, uh, uh, troop, troops there guard, guarding that fortress. The Germans captured that in a very short time because they came in silently and, and early in the morning, and they only lost six men killed and 20 men uh, wounded in that action. So the United States and Britain both thought, well, we need to have gliders for combat purposes. So in 1941, the United States started a, a program to build a CG-4A uh, Waco glider, and that's the illustration I have here. The Waco glider was designed to hold uh, 15 troops or four troops and a jeep or three troops and a 75 millimeter hauser. It was made out of tubular steel and, and plywood, three quarter inch plywood and uh, cotton uh, fabric. It um, was towed behind the C-47 on a 300 foot, uh, one inch nylon rope and tow, tow speed was normally 120 miles per hour. The uh, wing the wing is uh, uh, 75 feet across. The body is about 48 feet long and it's 12 and a half feet high. Uh, it um, is 13,900 gliders built in the United States in 16 different locations during World War II. And most of them were built in Mississippi and Ford Motor Company at a cost of about $17,000. Uh, the British start building a horse glider and the horse glider was larger than the Waco glider. It would hold 30 men uh, fully equipped, or it would hold carry two Jeeps, or a Jeep and a trailer and a few troops. But it was also made out of plywood. And the problem when they crash landed, that the horse glider would splinter really bad. So the troops on board could literally be stabbed to death uh, by those splinters uh, if, if, they, if they crash landed. The, uh, in the United States, they, they uh, trained 6,000 to 6,500 glider pilots during World War II. And they had silver wings similar to that of the Air Force, but in the center it had a G. And I asked the uh, guy I was interviewing, Robert, uh, what that G stood for. <laughs> he said, Bob, that stands for guts. <laughs> oh, 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 dummy me, I thought it stood for gliders, you know. <laughs> and and um, so today I'm going to talk about three men particularly. I'm going to talk about George Hess, who was a pilot, made seven combat landings in Burma Theater, and talk about Robert Calmore Jr. from Stapleton, Virginia, who uh, made three combat landings in Europe, and then also talk about Jim Bryant. First of all, I want to talk about uh, the Burma Theater because they gliders were used for a different reason there in Burma Theater than you'll find out in Normandy. Um, Jim George Hess was started his gliders training as a three months course, and the only thing he got was the free breakfast every morning. So 
his wife Linda went to work for fifteen dollars a week to pay the bills, and he flew uh, uh, gliders and C forty sevens in Burma Theater for nineteen months. George um, told me some things that I think would be of interest to you, because in Burma Theater they used a lot of mules. You see, the Burma Theater was the Allies had pulled out, and some went to China, some went to uh, India, and so the Japanese had complete control of Burma Theater. But they had to get the mules up front in order for the paratroopers to use them to carry their heavy equipment, weapons, and so forth. And uh, so they took bamboo poles and built in these gliders six stalls that would hold six mules and to take them up to the front. And one day at 8,000 feet, they were flying and this mule kicked the entire side out of the, out of the glider. And uh, he became the mule with the highest kick of any mule in history. <laughs> and I, I, think he still, I think he still holds that record today. Uh, George to talked about another thing that was very interesting. I think they, they built a snatch and they snatched, they used two vertical poles with a tow rope across it. And the C-47 planes would fly as low as 25 feet off the ground with a hook. And they would try to hook that uh, tow rope and snatch that glider off the ground into uh, 120 miles an hour within seven seconds. Now, the reason why this was so important is because if somebody was wounded, to get them to the hospitals over land, it would take uh, three months by jeep or by ambulance, but by using the snatch, they could put the wounded in there, take them back to the hospitals within two hours, and a lot of a lot of lives were, were saved that way. Three months before D-Day, it's March fifth, nineteen forty-four. There's another glider operation in Burma, and General uh, Wingate was in charge of this operation. They called it Operation Thursday. And um, he used 12,000 troops, 1,800 mules. I don't know where they get all those mules. <laughs> and um, uh, 80, 80 gliders, all the gliders he had. Now the 80 gliders, 35 of them crashed. And uh, there's 23 men killed and 30 or more wounded in that. And their mission was to go back and build a small landing strip. So the gliders that day were carrying bulldozers and, and carry-alls and jeeps and and uh, uh, equipment that the engineers needed in order to build this uh, build this airport. On June 4th and 5th, 1944, there's a lot of activity going on in this uh, airport just west at Berkshire, just west of London. And uh, they, uh, all their furloughs have been canceled and all the Men were restricted to base, and they put a wire fence around the compound, and they required all of the men to stencil on their footlockers their home address and put all their personal items in there in case they were killed and didn't, didn't make it back. And the reason why it was so is much excitement going on, because the next day, June 6th, was the big day that the invasion was to start. Um, the 101st Airborne, the 82nd Airborne uh, were both ready to lead the way. The 101st Airborne had two, two Goddard serials, and the code name was Chicago. Code name for the 82nd was Detroit. And they had 52 uh, C-47s lined up at an angle on one side of the runway, and 52 Goddards lined up on the other side of the runway, ready to take off in any minute. Uh, just for just for information, uh, the first British soldier to hit, hit the ground in Normandy was Bobby De La Tour. He was a British paratrooper, and the first American was Captain Frank Lilliman, who was a pathfinder for the 82nd Airborne. The highest uh, ranking officer killed on D-Day was General Don Pratt. Uh, Don Pratt had received his second. Lieutenant Commission in World War I, but now he's standing in uh, in England waiting to go into Normandy. And uh, he said that 
uh, he was an important man because he was the assistant commander of the 101st Airborne. So he asked his commander, General Michael Taylor, if he could go in the first serial of the first glider to land in Normandy. And uh, permission was granted. So Mike Murphy, a Lieutenant Colonel, who was there training glider pilots, he was an expert. He became the pilot of this uh, glider that General Pratt was in. When they came in next to Utah Beach, it looked like a good landing because the field was about 1,000, 12 feet long, and it looked like it was going to be a safe landing. But when they landed, there's tall grass, and the field and the grass was wet with dew, and the glider skidded off, of the, off the, the landing field into the hedgerows. A limb came through the co-pilot's window and killed him immediately. Uh, the colonel was had both legs broken and other injuries and the general was sitting in his jeep and passenger side and his neck was broken and he was killed as well the uh murphy said that the germans was coming by with flashlights to look into the uh, gliders that had crashed to see if anybody was still living so he pretended to be dead and the germans just went on and later that morning he tried to get out of his glider and tried to walk two broken legs, he just fell over in a ditch. And our troops found him, took him back to the beach and flew him to Scotland, to England, and back to the United States uh, for a series of operations. The general was buried, wrapped in a parachute and buried in that area. But on July the 3rd, they exhumed his body and uh, brought him back to the States. He's buried now in, Ar in Arlington National Cemetery. The uh, First pilot that I want to talk about is Robert Cal Moore Jr. He was born in Stapleton, Virginia. He was 89 years old when I interviewed him. He lived in Appomattox. Uh, these guys had tremendous stories, and I can only just barely, barely touch on them, of course, today. But he was a pilot before he went into the Air Force. He uh, soloed at Lynchport Airport uh, at age 16. At age 18, he became one of the youngest storm, barn stormers in the state of Virginia. He joined the Air Force on December 3rd, 1941, just four days before Pearl Harbor, and served with the 9th Air Force. Uh, Robert um, was uh, tell, tell me some stories because he made three combat landings. He landed, of course, in Normandy. They, they land, left early that the daybreak that, that, that morning and landed a couple hours later. But um, uh, in fact, uh, they, they landed, uh, Murphy and his group landed five seconds after midnight. So that gives you an idea of how they got, got in there in through with gliders before the invasion started. So Robert um, talk, has talked about all the training that they had to go through prior to the invasion. And he said, as we were going across the channel, he said, it came to me, all this training was just for this very moment. And uh, when they, they C-47 cut him loose, he was about 500 feet off the ground when he came over the uh, Normandy coast. He said, look down, he said, no Hollywood scene could ever capture this because he saw airplanes lying on the ground, burning and on fire. He saw the gliders that had crashed and, uh, all over the place. He saw the collapsed parachutes. He saw bursting shells and men running and dodging and dying. And he said, three minutes later, I was over my target. And one minute later, I was landing. He made a good landing. And in his gliders that day, he had a Jeep, a doctor, and, and four medics. Uh, what does the Goderman do after a pilot do after they land? Well, he becomes an infantry for a short time until they can get him back, it's where they can climb back to England. So he grabs a steel helmet and the M1 or some other weapon and goes into combat. And so Robert said that uh, he, uh, in, in his second combat, which was uh, in Market Garden, he said that <clears throat> on the third day of his uh, being with the infantry, they were digging foxholes. He hadn't eaten much in two days, and he decided 
to dig, they were digging foxhole by a, a little grocery store. And he went in this grocery store and stole a can of peaches. And when he started to open them, he noticed they were from Winchester, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he talked to me about uh, three different things that I think of, of be of interest to you. First of all, the Germans made it very difficult for the gliders to land. They dug square holes uh, two feet deep and they planted grass at it. So the glider pilot said coming in, it looked like it's going to be a smooth landing. But uh, if a wheel caught in one of those holes, it just flip it over and it completely fall apart. They also built what they call the Ramos asparagus. They took 16 foot poles, painted them green, and put them 50 to 75, 100 feet apart. And on each third pole, they would put munitions and uh, then they would uh, hook it up to the other poles by trip wire. So if a glider came in and hit that uh, pole, it would just explode. So our guys didn't call it Ronald's asparagus, they called it the Devil's Garden. And uh, so it, it made it very difficult for them to land and to know if, if they were going to crash or not. The uh, uh, Robert on his second mission was, as the mission was Market Garden, he was carrying an anti-tank gun. And the third thing he talked about was a double tow. And that meant that a, that a C-47 was towing two gliders instead of one. So the, in the rope, the tow rope, instead of being 300 feet long, the first one was 350 feet long. The second one was 425 feet long to keep the gliders 75 feet apart. And they had to cut them loose at the same time because one glider was carrying a Jeep and the other glider was carrying an anti-tank gun and uh, which Robert had an anti-tank gun, his commander and five troops on his glider that day. And so when they landed, the Jeep would drive out the front of the uh, Waco glider. See, the Waco glider is made like a clamshell, opens up and you can just drive a Jeep right up in it. And so they drive the Jeep out, come around, pick up the anti-tank gun and put it into action in, in, in a very, very short time. Uh, some of you might remember Walter Cronkite. He was a uh, correspondent and he landed in a glider in Market Garden. He said, I always thought that the wheels were for landing. And to my surprise, after we landed and scooting along the ground, the wheels came up through that plywood floor. And then he gave some advice. If you have to go into combat, don't go into glider. And right after that, he was had his typewriter and they were crawling because the Germans were shooting at him. And uh, he crawled, crawling on the ground. He looked behind him. There's a lot of soldiers behind him. He wondered what they were doing behind him. And, and one of the guys came up and told him the steel helmet he had on the back signify that he was an officer is the reason, reason he's going to follow him. <laughs> There's a lot of things that took place before in any action such as this, but I just want to mention one. His name is Red Wright. He was a British agent. He and several others went ashore, on, ashore at Normandy on small dinghies. The underground gave them some uh, uh, French clothing with gun, burnt, uh, barnyard dunk on it, make him smell like a farmer and gave him fake papers. And the only uh, weapon they had was a 45 caliber pistol, but they were there to to spy out two bridges called Ham and Jam and to let uh, our troops know before they came in uh, how many Germans were guarding that and how many uh, and, and what, what the location was. Um, on June June the 5th, just 40 miles from Pont de Hoc, was another uh, uh, action from the fighters. And this person that I'll be talking about, you probably know, because if you've seen The Longest Day, his, his activities and action is in that movie. And his, his uh, was Major John Howard. Major Howard was... Uh, in charge of the this unit paratroopers going in, he had he had six horse gliders and 181 men uh, to land, and his job was to capture 
two ridges intact. And because of the surprise attack, they captured that in just a matter of minutes. And uh, it was the first Allied victory of the Norman invasion. Uh, he, out of the six planes, five of those planes landed within 47 yards of the uh, target area. But Major Howard, uh, pilot, happened to be the number one pilot in Britain. But he made a rough landing, and the pilot and co-pilot was shot through the wire windows in front of that glider, and all the men aboard were knocked unconscious. Uh, Major Howard's uh, seatbelt came broke and threw him up to the ceiling. His helmet came down over his face, and he was unconscious. And when he woke up, he said, I'm either dead or I'm blind. And then he adjusted his helmet over his eyes, and he, he said, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that kind of made, made a difference there. But his is a fantastic story, and, and uh, you might want to read about him some, some days. In the early hours uh, before, uh, before June 6th, there's another uh, glider operation. Lieutenant uh, Colonel Watway was in charge of this. And his, his mission was to uh, go in and capture and silence the coastal guns, which are four big guns, uh, and they uh, were encased in heavy concrete and they had 200 German soldiers guarding th those guns. He, uh, he, they achieved, they, they achieved their mission, but uh, the problem was that they had three assault gliders and they were carrying jeeps and heavy guns and equipment and so forth. That was really needed. One of those gliders uh, landed too far away to be assistance. One was shot down by the Germans, and the third one landed close by. So the colonel could only muster 150 men to attack those 200 German, uh, 200 uh, ger German soldiers there, and he uh, broke it up in four different groups and attacked. It was successful, but he had 50% casualty rate. He saw, uh, going overhead, he saw an observation plane, so he sent a message to it to report back to London that this, this operation had been successful. Um, to be sure that they got the message, a uh, short time later, he sent a message by the Duke of Normandy. It took the Duke of Normandy 26 hours and 50 minutes to get back to London, and uh, he was a carrier pigeon. And one day I was doing tours here at the DA Memorial, and, and I had a British guy on. I said, why did it take the Duke so long to get back to England? He said, well, I say there, Mike. I think that it took the Duke uh, 26 hours and 50 minutes because he took the scenic route going around and see what Berlin was like on the way back to London, you see. Well, about a year later, I had another British guy on shore on, on my tour. I used that dumb accent, <clears throat> and that's what he called it. He looked at me and said, Bob, that is a dumb accent. <laughs> I said, sir, you ought to try to speak West Virginian. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on the evening of D-Day, on June 6th, there were two more fighter operations, and they took off at 6.30 in the evening and arrived in Normandy about 8.53. And their job was to take in two battalions of artillery troops and their guns. And those 15 guns that they took in uh, were in operation within within two days. And then just before daybreak on June the 7th, the next day, there's two more kind of operations. And the code name was uh, Galveston and ha Hackensack. And they took in, uh, yeah, they used 100 gliders in this operation to take in almost 1,000 troops uh, and to re as replacements. The third guy that I mentioned was Jim Bryant. Jim Bryant was a uh, lot. Some people here know him, knew him. He came to the deck and would talk to people. And Jim was a super guy, and and I just loved him. He he was a career soldier. He was born in Southampton County, Virginia. He uh, was not a pilot, but he was a gliderman. He landed in Normandy. Uh, uh, D-Day plus one. He said the night before they slept all um, slept by the glider on June 6th, ready to take off in any minute. 
And then a big grin came across his face. He said, but we had a great breakfast before we left. We had <laughs> fresh eggs, not powdered eggs, fresh eggs, ham, and bacon and fries. And uh, Jim also landed in the Goddard in Market Garden. He also fought in the Battle of the Vault where he was awarded Silver Star for gallantry in action. And he also served uh, in several battles in, in, in the Korean War. So uh, he, he was quite a guy and uh, he's written a book, I don't know where he's still in the gift shop or not, Flying Coffins Over Europe. And uh, you might want to, you might want to buy that and and, uh, and and read it sometime. Now I trained in one of these CG4A Waco gliders in Fort Benning, Georgia. After I received my paratrooper wings, I uh, they trained us in gliders, not as a pilot, but how to tie all the knots and tie all the equipment, jeeps and everything into into the gliders. And they took us on a ride, which was exciting. And uh, I, I had that privilege of being able to have flown, you know, in a, in a, in a glider. Um, uh, there's a lot of other duties for the C-47. It was an act, outstanding, tough plane, but they took some of them and made hospital planes out of them. And they built 24 litters in the plane where they could haul 24 of the uh, wounded back to the hospitals. Before they left England, though, they would load up with shoes and ammunition and barrels of gasoline and powdered eggs and powdered <laughs> milk and, um, and blankets and things like that. And when they got to Normandy, they would unload all this equipment and then they'd load up 24 of the wounded soldiers. Now, the, the engines of this 47 never stopped. Uh, when they landed, they had a, a fighter escort overhead. They would unload, load up the wounded, and then wait for a clearance to take off. And it was dangerous because in the first two days, it's 42 uh, C-47 shot down, 21 of those in, during uh, D-Day, and 11 of those were shot down while they were towing gliders. So uh, it it was, uh, they had to be, had to fight an escort to, to help them. Um, I can't leave this particular area until I mention my favorite air <coughs> fact nurse. And some of you knew her and loved her dearly, but Evelyn Kowalczyk. Evelyn um, said when they left New York to go to England on ship, there were 24 of us nurses on board and thousands of GIs. And using her words, she said, we had a heck of a good time. <laughs> But Evelyn told me about uh, the wounded they picked up and how they would redress them and put oil, olive oil on the bodies of those who had been burned and the attitude of the soldiers and, and, and so forth. But she said she had never seen anybody with both arms or both legs amputated. And that's just one of the uh, things that she suggested and uh, shared, shared with me. Um, the last glider of World War II was on March 24th, 1945. This is when they crossed the Rhine and the 1,348 Waco and uh, horse gliders used in this operation to carry paratroops and carry the jeeps and equipment and so, so forth. And uh, that's a lot of gliders, 1,348 gliders. But, um, this was Robert's third and final mission. And uh, he went back to England, stayed for six weeks, tour England, see what it was like. And then he went back to the hospital to be checked out and sent home. But the doctor found that he had a bad case of battle fatigue, which is now today PTSD. And uh, they kept him in the hospital there, sent him back to Station Hospital under observation for six months before he was, or he was released. The Defense Department ended the Goddard program in 1952. Um, the Goddard pilots, some of them, people called them the suicide jockeys. And I think that's a pretty good name, but I, I think the G for guts uh, is certainly appropriate here for, for these guys. Um, 
they flew planes with that an engine that was made out of three quarter inch plywood and cotton cloth. They were called flying coffins. They flew into areas that they didn't know how the landing was going to be because of the holes that the Germans dug or the uh, rumbles asparagus where they also flooded some of the fields with six feet of water. And there's a lot of stumps and so forth that would cause the, the, the accidents as well. So they always felt like that they would probably crash on landing. It's interesting to see that uh, in, the, in Normandy itself, that the gliders flew in 3,973 troops in the Normandy, in, in addition to mortars, artillery, doctors, medical supplies, and, and all of that. Uh, they went behind enemy lines time after time, and they were men that I think were very brave men. And uh, if you look at uh, heroes like Moore and Hess and Bryant, uh, their memories will last on because of their commitment, because of their dedication to duty, and because of their uh, br bravery uh, unequally in serving their country. Nor Jor General Norman Schwarzkopf said that there's things worth fighting for, there are things worth dying for, and that thing is freedom. So I'm going to end my talk with a, a minute and a half poem that uh, ROTC student wrote one day. I saw a flag pass by one day, and it fluttered in a breeze, and a young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud, with hair cut square and eyes alert, he'd stand out in any crowd. I wondered how many times a man like him had fallen through the years, how many died on foreign soil, how many mother's tears, how many pilot's planes shot down, how many died at sea, how many foxholes were soldiers' graves, no freedom is not free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugle play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered how many times that the flag had draped the coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought about all the children, the mothers and wives, the fathers, sons and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about the graveyards at the bottom of the sea, or the unmarked graves in Arctic and no, freedom is not free. Our flag, oh glory, I don't see one here. Oh, glory is a symbol of freedom to everyone who stands beneath this unfurled glory. So my God bless all of you and the homes you represent. And may the glory continue to wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. That was great. There's a flag over there in that case. So, uh, retreat from the surf of Omaha, Omaha Beach on me day. Um, we'll leave some time for some questions. Whether you are watching online, you can submit it, uh, and Adam will read them to me. If you have one here um, out in the studio audience, uh, any questions for Bob? Bill? I want to ask about being hooked up with C-47. C-47 burned the glider boats, right? The glider couldn't turn loose from the C-47. But who, who, who initiated the, the turn the turn the glider loose? The question the question is uh the, the mechanics of releasing the glider. Was it the glider pilot or the uh, C-47? The C-47 would release the glider. And I want y'all to look at this guy here. You know, I was a paratrooper, and every time I went up in the airplane, I had to jump out and walk back. So for years, I hated this guy because he was Air Force. <laughs> but, but I've learned to respect him and love him because of the service he gives, and he's become a dear friend of mine. But the, the C-47s released the glider. If you were in the glider, 
or seven got shot down. Could you get away from it? Some of them, some of them could. That's the reason they had May West in case you go across the channel. But um, uh, Robert said on his uh, Mark Garden uh, battle that they didn't have a co pilot, they didn't have a one set of controls, they didn't have the communication with the uh, C 47 in no way west. He said we were really uncomfortable. Uh, one of the one of the uh, tow ropes uh, in Burma was lo lo lost. You know, it fell to the ground, and for several days they didn't, couldn't find it. But the, the uh, people there brought it back to where the guard had landed, and they they were stuck there for six weeks. Tess said, and uh, they didn't have any facilities. They didn't have uh, a mess hall. They didn't have a tent. And they lived on uh, canned sardines for about six weeks. And then the <clears throat> plane was coming over to do the snatch, and they had the poles up with, with the tow rope across. And it came in too low and knocked the poles down, so they had to get out, put them back up. So they don't always hit that first time around. You're my hero, you know that. <laughs> 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 I was, I was up here once, Bob was out on the plaza, and there was an Air Force guy, and uh, introduced himself to Bob and said, hey, you're one of those guys that jumps out of a perfectly good airplane. And remember what you replied? I said, I've never seen a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, ma'am. Bob, how did you arrange some interviews? How did you hook up with these guys to interview them? The question is, I'm, I'm saying the question's over for, for the uh, camera there, but the... Uh, the question is uh, how you arranged the uh, the interviews of the people you've, you've done, and how many books? I, I've written I've, I've written three military books, and I've interviewed these people, most of them in person, and I interviewed them on tape, and then I told their story. These three three guys I talked about today, Moore, Hess, and Bryant, are in my book, uh, Respect Forgotten Heroes. There's no more of those left. You might find somebody. Uh, that has one to read, read more about their stories. But uh, I, I, I would go into their home. <laughs> one person recommended another one. I was insurance business for 30 years, so I knew how to get recommendations. So I would ask if I, I would ask questions, and they'd give me, "Do you hear about Woody Williams? Do you hear about so and so?" And then I go to their home, and they'd recommend me somebody else. And if all the people I interviewed, I would look at the DD 214s, make sure that they were telling me the truth because it tells when they went in, when they got out, what battles they were in, what medals they earned, et cetera. And uh, so I only had one person out of all those people that I interviewed that I wouldn't accept because uh, he wasn't telling the truth. But uh, most of these men had never talked about their combat experiences to their families. I didn't talk to my two sons and my wife until I wrote the book on Korea. But uh, they had talked to them because, because unless you've been there and done that, people just don't understand. And they'll, if you talk about it and tell the truth, they'll think you're either exaggerating or, or lying. And uh, none of us want to be tag, tagged that way. So I would go from person to person and interview. Have you heard about so-and-so? Heard about so-and-so? And I could call and go to their home, or they'd come to my home and I'd interview them on, on tape. Yeah. I was very fortunate in hundreds of veterans that I got to interview and talk to and get their stories. And they'd sit there and cry, and I'd cry with them. They'd laugh, and I'd laugh with them because I knew what they'd gone through. Thank you. A little off the subject of the uh, the gliders, but uh, you mentioned Woody Williams, and I know he was a, a dear friend of yours. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about Woody. Woody Williams, uh, <clears throat> I was doing my second book, and I never heard of Woody, and he was recommended because he was a Medal of Honor recipient. And I thought, oh, goodness, what kind of a guy am I going to find here, you know? So I went into his home and met him and his wife 
and uh, it was just really ordinary people. And uh, he just just a great person because and he sat there and talked to me and shared with me and answered all my questions. And uh, we became friends at that time for the next 15 years before he died, 98 years old this, this year. But what he was um, a humble person. He was a kind person. He was a good Christian man. And uh, he used his time wisely uh, as and his, uh, his honor of being a Medal of Honor recipient uh, to build over 100 Gold Star family monuments in the country. They're building one right now in Guam. And he told me he'd hoped to live in order to go there to dedicate it. But um, so he traveled around the country. Uh, it has him in every state in the United States. And, and, uh, and about 100 yards that way. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the first ones was here at DD Memorial. The one in Charleston, West Virginia, is twice the size of all the rest of them because it's in the Capitol grounds. And, uh, but he was just very, very special. We talked about every couple of weeks or so. And I, he called and asked me how I was doing. And he's 98 years old. I, uh, I'm 92. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd ask him, well, how are you doing, buddy? He said, no pain, no brain. <laughs> that was his response. So I hand it back. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob. Uh... I think most historians uh, conclude that uh, D-Day was the most challenging military operation in the history of warfare. Would you comment on the critical nature of the airborne operations and glider operations to the success of D-Day and the challenges they had with a nighttime operation with the weather, et cetera? The question is about the uh, how critical were the airborne operations? to the uh, overall success of D-Day. If my memory is correct, there's 13,500 paratroopers that jumped into Normandy, uh, British and, and American. Uh, but the, the gliders took, uh, took the, the troops in and everything in. As I mentioned, uh, they landed five seconds after, after midnight. So they were in there behind enemy lines before the day invasion started. So it was very, very critical. And of course, they, uh, they engaged uh, combat immediately and uh, had several missions to accomplish. And, uh, but paratroopers uh, made, uh, I had one lieutenant in my outfit in Korea that made three combat jumps in World War II. And he made two in Korea, so he had five total. Only person I ever knew that had that many. But um, General Gavin was in, uh, became in charge of the 82nd. Actually, General uh, Matthew B. Ridgway was, and when they went in Normandy, was commander 82nd, and General Michael Taylor was in command of the 101st Airborne. Um, the uh, Gavin became, he's one of my favorite generals because uh, he went into service uh, and they wanted him to uh, try out for West Point. He said, I don't have an education. And the sergeant really liked him, gave him some books to study, and he applied and was accepted. He was the youngest major general at that time in, in the Second World War. But they played a very important part. Any other questions or any come in on my um, so someone's wondering about the stripes on the glider plane. Oh yeah, tell us about those stripes. All the all, all the jeeps, tanks, trucks, and planes were painted uh, white, black, white, black, so we know enough to shoot our own people down. <laughs> and so that glider happens to be have the stripes on it that uh, was on all the other equipment. And uh, so that's the Allies was identified in that way. Um, someone else was wondering, I guess, about the mechanism um, for releasing the, the tow rope, but if the C-47 pilot missed the landing zone, could the, the glider pilots not release the tow planes? No, the, the, the landing zones were selected by uh, pathfinders who parachuted in ahead of time and would locate uh, the fields for them to land in. And um, 
uh, they pilot, C-47 pilots, it's when they got over that area that they knew, knew what the coordinates was, they would release that glider. And uh, for example, uh, John Howard's glider was released at 6,000 feet. He was about three miles from the uh, target area. And uh, so that's the way they would release them. So they'd have to glide around and fly in and try to find that field. And they, they were looking for, uh, for wires and, and fences and things like that uh, in order to avoid them in coming in. But they were all cut, surrounded usually with big hedgerows, trees 30, 40 feet high. And they had to, they come in and wing when he hit to one of those trees and just tear that glider completely up. And uh, another one came in on this particular one and uh, hit uh, one of the trees and, and just flew all the place out of three quarter inch plywood, you know, they weren't very strong. I believe one more. So someone wants to know about the relationship between fighter pilots and the glider pilots. Um, did they interact much? Was there much of a relationship? Well, they uh, got pilots, as I mentioned, <laughs> were called uh, suicide jockeys. They they weren't as respected as the Air Force. And uh, just to uh, give, give you one more comparison, the paratroopers and the glottermen uh, didn't have a good relationship. They fought all the time. They had a lot of broken noses and, <laughs> and uh, black eyes because the uh, paratroopers got $50 extra a month. The government didn't get, and Gladman, the uh, uh, paratroopers had a hat patch, they blouse their boots. Gladman couldn't do that, but later it was changed where they got the $50 extra a month in a patch. And But uh, the pilots, uh, the, the only communication they had really with, with the pilot to tell them when, how close they were to the area where they're going to cut them loose and then they tell them when they're cutting them loose and they were on their own then to find the spot to land those must have been some epic fights because glidermen were pretty tough paratroopers were pretty tough yeah they, <laughs> yeah that <laughs> a lot of nosebleeds and broken noses <laughs> <laughs> okay well any other questions uh, but I know if you're watching online, you can't tell back behind us. Uh, you can't tell where you're sitting now, but uh, uh, afterwards, you're welcome to come and take a look. This is a uh, poster of a glider signed by D-Day veterans in 2009, 65th anniversary of D-Day. And uh, just above the, the wing of the glider there is James Bryant's signature. So uh, you're welcome to take a look at that um, afterwards. Uh, well, if there are no further questions, we want to thank Bob for this fascinating program. Um, you, I mean, I can never hear enough about what these guys did, what they were like, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who joined us, either here in our Education Quonset or online, thank you for uh, joining in on our Lunchbox Lecture. I invite you back for future ones. Check back with our webpage, dday.org for the schedule of upcoming events and lectures, uh, our podcast and all the information you need. Uh, but we look forward to having you with us again.